this computer. Okay. Thank you, Joe, for making time for this conversation. Um, we briefly met during the regenerative practitioner training that, that I um, took and helped to organize here in Europe in 2017. And um, I can't believe it's already been well, more than two years since we last talked. So, Your daughter must be big now. Yeah, she's one <laughs> and a handful uh, and a heartful. Um, so yeah, one, wonderful to, to speak with you. And um, I, I looked at your bio today and, and what stood out was that you've been a, um, a builder, a farmer, a teacher, a naturalist, a writer, a storyteller, and a permaculturist for 30 years. Mm. Um, and in this series that I've started of having conversations with who I consider elders of ge regenerative practice, people like you, um, I, I like to start with inviting people to just talk about um, what got them onto this path. What are the, like maybe some of the key moments that really you still think of that you made a decision there? Or um, yeah, what, what, what has informed your path and, and tell us a little bit about how you got here now? Yeah, great. Um, it's a great question. Um, and as you know, right, the way we understand things is through stories. That there's a way in which wherever you are in the story, you're connected to everything else in that story, both behind us and in front of us. And um, for me, it's really clear. I grew up, uh, my dad was a builder. So I spent a lot of time um, in that industry, which is one of the last places where people work outside except for agriculture right and at that time there were no nail guns there were power tools obviously but it was very much still a craftsperson um skill oriented trade oriented um endeavor and i was born in the city in philadelphia and when i was about eight we moved out to the country where my mom had grown up what was then the far edge of the suburbs has now been swallowed by the suburbs of Philadelphia. And so I grew up in fields and farms and barns and um, spent most of my time in the forest, remnant forest behind my parents' house. And I didn't know the names of species. I didn't know many of those things, but um, it spoke to me. And it was where I felt comfortable and things made sense. And so that's informed my life ever since, that there's ways in which um, much of my life has been a, uh, a way of trying to give back to everything that I was given by that beautiful little forest. Um, and spending so much time in that forest, I began to wonder about the original people there and they, how they had lived in that place in different ways. And so I began to read all the books I could and um, came upon a copy of um, Black Elk Speaks in the mall one weekend with my dad. And um, it rocked my world that it was being a child of about the same age he was when he had his great vision. Um, it didn't, it wasn't well filtered. And so it gave me an entirely different view of the world of not only this sacred spiritual level of reality and of the living world, but people um, being a part of a harmonious living whole and moving around and being in relation to all the cycles and changes and developments and evolutions and contributing to those in the landscape and the more than human community, right? Everyone is elders. So I was whatever, 10, 12 years old, stealing my mom's Virginia Slims to make tobacco offerings to trees before I cut them down to build forts, right? And um, entirely clueless um, um, to ideas like cultural appropriation or anything else because I, I, was, I was just trying to follow what spoke to me. And um, so I, when I went to college and I came here to New Mexico, I had a job um, remodeling a house um, because that's what I knew how to do. I had grown up doing that and we were almost done and a landscaper came and started to repair the damage we had wrought to the land, replanting native grasses and native plants. And it made me realize I would much rather do that than create the damage. Mm -hmm. So I got a job doing native landscaping here in Santa Fe. And I did that throughout college um, with plants of the Southwest. And then I became involved with a 
agricultural seed saving project here at one of the pueblos, at Okeawenge, San Juan Pueblo. And um, we put together this amazing seed bank that went on to become Seeds of Change. Mm -hmm. And I began to learn about permaculture. Uh, my boss at Plants of the Southwest was actually Ben Haggard, and that's where I first saw permaculture and permaculture two. Mm -hmm. And I went off and did a permaculture course at New Alchemy um, in the late 80s with John Todd and Bill McClarney and Rosalind Creasy and all these yeah. heavy hitters. And um, that was my second PhD supervisor, so I, I, I know right. him. Yeah. He was hugely influential on me. Yeah. And um, soon after that, I, there was a weekend workshop here in Lamy, New Mexico with Bill Mullison. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had gotten a huge amount of the Rice Krispies and not a whole lot of the treat. So there was a lot of very great depth into techniques and technologies and not so much about their relationship or reading landscape or any of that. Mm -hmm. So I did a two week design course with Mollison in, I don't know, 88, 89, um, Drylands course, and then went on to begin to teach and practice all of these things. I was married to a woman from Santa Clara Pueblo at the time, mm -hmm. um, and um, we developed flowering tree permaculture. And so we looked at what people had done here forever and looked at other species that could be brought in and talked to old men and looked at the landscape and went to old ruins and um, developed that site as a way of seeing, do these things work and how do they work here with these people? And um, I did a video about this a couple of years ago called Greening the Desert, 30 Years Greening the Desert. You could see it at Flowering Tree, I'm sorry, at patternmind.org. Um, and the beginning sequence of that film is zooming in on Google Earth and you see the desert Southwest. And as you get in, you start to see this little postage stamp green food forest oasis and when i first made that sequence i patted myself on the back and thought how wonderful that was and in the middle of the night i woke up and realized my point was not just to demonstrate these things worked it was to change how we see the land and how we relate to the land and if i had done it effectively that little oasis would have spread everywhere it would be like the first blades of grass in a meadow instead of that it remained this little isolated postage stamp. Mm -hmm. And it's in Guy's Garden and people from around the world have seen it and been inspired by it. But I was not intelligent enough at the time to know how to design a process to engage the community, to change how we saw the land and treated the land differently. I had this mentality of build it and they will come to show that you could do this and everybody's gonna change their mind and change their lives. And that was very naive. It was such a deep lesson. I mean, of course, we need these watering holes and we need these examples, but how much energy of amazing people is going into making their one permaculture demonstration plot, being stewards of those two, six, 15 acres and doing a beautiful job with it, but, but not looking at um, how, how the yogurt culture can turn the milk into yogurt. Uh, Absolutely, yes that it's not strategically placed, it's simply placed. Um, and it's also thinking, we're materialists is what it made me realize, that I thought, oh, I could change this physical thing and then that will change people's minds. Instead of realizing that no, actually, the strategic place to work is in our minds, in our consciousness. And one of the things I do is tracking, which we'll talk a bit more about, but. It, um, when we see everything we see is a track, right? But we think it's reality, but it's a track of a biological reality. It's a physical track of a biological reality. Mm -hmm. And my body, your body, the cup, the buildings, the books, the food forests. And that it's, I was thinking the other day, it's almost as if we think that, oh, there's a track of a deer. If I take a stick and I turn those deer tracks into elk tracks, it doesn't make the deer into an elk, right? That the, the underlying pattern that left the track 
must be changed to change the tracks. It doesn't go backwards, mm -hmm. right? And so um, back in the day, Ben Haggard and Tim Murphy and myself doing permaculture work and teaching permaculture began to notice that our projects were not having the effects we were after, mm -hmm. that they didn't have a long life. They certainly were not permanent in any way. Mm -hmm. um, they got second guessed, all of those kind of things. So we encountered Bob and Pamela Mang, Ben and Tim taught a course that they took and they realized that we were looking at the same things they were looking at from an organizational development point of view and systems thinking point of view from a more grounded experiential point of view. Though we also were very aware of the need for how we saw the world to change and systems thinking. So we formed Regenesis. This was um, oh, um, the 90s. So over 20 years ago. Right. This is just very briefly, this is fascinating to me because in many years later, um, there was this little German guy um, doing his, his master's at Schumacher College and, and kind of getting on a path around 2001. And, and I ended up doing this PhD in 2006 where just what you framed, framed slightly differently, but exactly the same things of this issue that everything is an intervention, that, every, that, that designs go on designing and that we live in a world that is full of the patterns of previous design decisions that we repeat mm. without questioning and that inform us this, this loop between worldview and design. And, and there, so like, like um, Churchill said, first we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us, like really taking that awareness to everything we do and how it leaves that track. And, and then shapes reality space. And so the, I, I then called the work upstream from that meta design that, that shifts the worldview and value system and the underlying thinking patterns, the, the, the organizing ideas that then make people bring forth a different world. So that's why I think my, I so deeply resonate with the work of Regenesis because I've sort of dabbled in trying to understand the same thing and 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 kind of given it initially an academic framework in the last 10 years well by now 15 years also tried to apply that somehow in my work um yeah just just in, in parentheses but you were yeah great you started with genesis by now 30 years ago so 20 some years ago maybe 25 years ago now um and one of the big shifts we made was um, as you're saying, going as far upstream as we could. Mm -hmm. And we decided to focus on the real estate development field because it is the most destructive. It and agriculture are some of the most destructive forces on the face of the planet. Um, and it has this word development in it. And it's very much a misunderstanding of how do you develop the value of land, of developing the value of places. Um, help that be revealed. And so that's what we focused on these 20 some years. Um, and, it, you know, took some things from John Lyle and mm -hmm. writing about regenerative development back in what the 70s, 80s. Yeah. Um, and tried to, one of the things that really got us all to see is that permaculture design is not about designing a site. It's not about physical design of where things go in relationship to one another. That is a level that we all enter at. But it is re-examining and designing, as you're saying, the design process. And the, because we don't, we, we design both things and the processes to put them into being. And it's often those processes that are the, have the greatest effects in the world. But most of them are habitual, whether it's how we go about building a building or making dinner or getting from here to there. Um, and so we've worked for these 20 some years um, to get the development industry to begin to one, appreciate place and how places behave all uniquely and differently, just like each of us and every snowflake. And that's where their potential lies. And um, to begin to re-examine our worldview and to actually engage stakeholders as an essential piece of it, not to convince them to let you do what you want to do 
or to get everybody's opinion, but to go on a developmental journey together to reimagine what this place could be, understand this place is a very deep level as a larger being that we are like organs within and to look for um, how do we help regenerate the innate potential in each of us in this place as a socio-ecological whole. Mm -hmm. So it's neither just a piece of dirt on the map, it's a living system of which we are an essential piece and have essential roles that living systems are dying for us to play. Yeah. And in all, all the boundaries in that transforming whole are somewhat real and arbitrary at the same time. Like we, they, they, they're all fluid. Um, and, and also wholeness is not additory. So, so it's not that you're just a piece in that larger whole, you are actually it. Um, it's like this is one thing that I learned from from Henry Bothoft and Goethean science that um, this real what what Henry calls authentic wholeness that has very strongly actually inf also informed the work of um, David Seaman and, and Christopher Alexander that mm. holes are not additive they like authentic holes the parts and the whole bring forth each other in a in a dynamic um, relationship. And well, I, I often tell this story of when my oldest son was, I don't know, four months old. I was holding him at night and he was sleeping. <clears throat> Excuse me. And having built things my whole life, I thought about how I would make his miraculous body. And so I would, of course, frame him up. I'd put all those bones together and attach it with tendons and ligaments and muscles and I'd run his circulatory system and his nervous system and install all of his organs and sheath them with skin and um, make sure all the joints worked, fill them up with blood and some food and some water and <laughs> start them up. And um, it made me realize that that is how I and I think we think about designing and making anything, even a curriculum or a school or a business that we think we are going to create it structurally and then articulate it somehow. And then we turn it on and it begins to operate. Right. This is, this is such a fascinating, like the, the metaphor you or the image you just used, because I've just gone through this with my um, two and a half year old daughter and coming back, coming from a biological training and, and um, a long line of, of medics, my, my mom and my grandfather and so on. I, Lucia just seeing like even from the beginning that we know that we were pregnant um, the, the thought that there was this magic process happening of two cells meeting and then going to, to four and to eight and to 16 and, 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 and then this little ball eh? and then suddenly it was going through all the evolutionary stages of, of kind of looking like fish looking like chicken looking mm. like and 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 then nine months later this magical being is come into the world and and since then it's just been evolving like Lucia has evolved so rapidly and every day I thought I can't believe we really think that our technology has that we call technology has anything against the, the intelligence and the complexity of biological processes the arrogance we have to even compare what we can do crudely within that te technological mechanistic frame and how how nature works with processes it's one of the reasons i've come to call biology metaphysics because it may be in physical bodies of all sorts but um the life is is not physically within anything right it's it's the exchanges that are happening, right? As soon as I stop breathing and the atmosphere stops rushing into my lungs and every cell and rushing back out and, and my heart stops beating and I stop water and food, stop jumping up off the earth and through my mouth and um, that the life is the exchange within those physical mechanical structures. And there's this, a couple remarkable things in there. Your daughter, my son, each of us was never not a whole, right? And, right, the river was never not a whole. And all of us, the tree, 
and each of us was made, our structure was made by carrying out the processes that we're still carrying out, metabolizing nutrients with the use of oxygen, um, moving, learning, um, the water flowing made the river, right? The tree taking atmospheric carbon and sunlight and putting it into the earth and taking water and nutrients and putting them up into the sky. That started when that seed was sprouting, right? And so all biological structures were formed carrying out the processes they were formed to carry out. It's a remarkable shift in how we view the world. And that's what I'm always looking for. Two, two things, and we're going a little bit on, on, a, on a detour here, but this is fascinating for me um, because I wanted to get there later. Um, it's almost like I can encapsulate it with, with um, Goethe, suppose, like, like said 250 years ago, who doesn't see nature everywhere, sees her nowhere in the right light. Mm -hmm. And when, when even, like I, even as I was speaking earlier about technology and life, I, I was observing myself um, thinking, well, yeah, but here you, you are again creating a dualism between technology and nature um, and the, the best way i've come to if you really sit deeply with that sentence of goethe and then you, you, you and it kind of makes sense that the earth within the solar system within the cosmos all of that is nested wholeness and even if you stay just within the biosphere it's one transforming process of which nothing is outside therefore all our technology has to somehow also be seen as nature um, that jars with me to some extent the only way i can reintegrate that is to say there are adaptive and maladaptive pathways in the evolutionary journey and um, those kind of like atomic power plant or nuclear weapon um, are just maladaptive dead ends in that natural system but, but I, i'm just how, how do you how do you square that I, I mm -hmm. see nature everywhere and then our deep attention to learning as nature from nature to then be able to design as nature and and bring health and wholeness to the system that we participate in but that also like that brings us forth and that we co-create this because there's this dimension of mind as well like li because you said life is it not easier to say that everything is alive sure. to some extent? So it, it, it's one of the reasons why we always talk about living systems as opposed to nature, mm -hmm. right? And it, all of this also carries over into what we call mind. Exactly. Right? If you listen to a Buddhist, they will say, your mind, yeah. right? It's not some intellectual thing that's separate. And it's what's behind Gregory Bateson's mind and nature and necessary unity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, if we, so if we go this route that everything is a living system, including a business, including a factory, right? Um, as long as there is what we could, would consider a living system. So if, if a system is something that is organized around a purpose, right? Um, then a bicycle has a purpose, um, but a pile of bicycle parts does not. It's not organized around a, a purpose, mm -hmm. right? And once I get onto that bicycle and I'm a part of that living system, um, I'm operating it in that direction, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so, um, one of the profound, let me tell a story and then I'll go here. So I have had the honor and privilege for over 20 years to help teach a Native American permaculture design course here in New Mexico. And we've had people from all over the hemisphere, north and south. And one year early on, we were up at Pickery's Pueblo. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of students. Some of them were high school students from Pickery's and um, you probably know, right, all of the issues of incarceration and poverty and 
abuse and alcoholism, drug abuse and suicide are far worse in indigenous communities than they are in any other community, African-American, whatever disadvantaged group. Um, and we were embarked in this journey of figuring stuff out. We have these horrible ecological problems, human beings are destroying the planet, um, we can do water harvesting and we can do this and we can do passive solar and thinking that so much of it had to do with technology. And uh, I was supposed to be up in the front of the room and this old man gets up and I'm thinking, what are you doing? I'm, this is important. And uh, he looked around to everybody. It was after lunch and everybody's a little sleepy and chatty. And he said, everybody make a, make a fist and hold it up. He holds up his fist. And he says, see how your knuckles go up and down, up and down, up and down, just like the mountain ridge, just like the water in the valley. Look at the spiral on your hand, just like the water in the drain or behind the rock where the trout sits, like a big storm. And then he looked at every one of us and pointed his finger at every one of us. And he said, no square people here, we all belong. And he was governor of the Pueblo, Mr. Quinchella. And uh, he did this marvelous thing where we were telling this story that human beings are bad and we got to figure out how to be better. And we have to use our intelligence to design systems that are less bad. And maybe they could help heal things, right? But basically human beings are bad. And he said, no. We are here for a reason, right? And uh, our job is to figure out that reason, right? And he would say, remember our original instructions, right? And to, to, to discover what each of us is alive to give back to the rest of the community, human and other than human, more than human, however you want to talk about it. That's a they're all, we're all people, right? There's the rock people and the tree people and the, right? Um, and so there's something very Buddhist in there. And it makes me realize that I'm, we're constantly making these dichotomies, good, bad, that because we have this mechanical mindset, we're always trying to identify the bad part that is to blame for the problem and repair, remove, or replace it. Mm -hmm. We do this in foreign policy. There's the bad guy, take him out. There's the guy dealing drugs, take him out. There's the spark plug, right? It's what we do. And it, we do it in the environmental movement. Petrochemicals, we got to get rid of. Oh, this bank is funny. We got to get rid of it. Instead of that, um, what if we're all here for a reason? And that the whole question is, which is a harder question, how do we regenerate us all? How do we make petrochemicals a force for regeneration? How do we make the banking industry a force for regeneration? How do we shift our, our minds, our hearts, our beings, our worldviews, our whole, our souls, so that we take on this responsibility and opportunity of being human beings to play this co-creative, regenerative role within the living world? And that to me is far more inspiring than you're bad and you're destroying the planet. You're going to kill everything and stop it. Exactly. Right. And that I, the beginning of my book these days is what if climate change is the best thing that's ever happened to us? What if it is the thing that is enough to get us to wake up and pay attention and rise to what we're all capable of? Right, the, the the beauty and miraculousness human beings are capable of is is amazing, right? And architecture and art and music and kindness and um, creativities of all sorts. And so that you know, it's funny. This I was telling the story of how I got here, mm -hmm. and within being part of Re Regenesis, um, I had a student. I was teaching permaculture and it was this 
community college course, they had a different teacher every week. And I came in and this young guy kind of latched on to me, started to travel around with me. Solar Law is his name. And um, he wanted to learn by going with me teaching. And so he started to contribute things. So he began to use the Thanksgiving address in the morning and do some workout things. And he taught me how to make fire. And pretty soon I met his teacher, John Stokes, who started something called the Tracking Project. I uh, wanted to ask you more about that. So, so please continue. So um, I began to work with John and learn from him. He and I, we went out to Navajo land to do something. And so we're in the car eight hours together and we got out and he said, oh, you've read the other half of the same library I've been reading. The point being that the library of life, right, of living systems. And then I was looking from a larger systems point of view, and he was looking at tracks writ large, right? So um, I've learned a lot from working there, and it's, I need to be out, right? I can't just be in my head or talking to people. And um, it also is connect, right? Tracking is storytelling. Right? You're reading the tracks in the ground, in the landscape, um, just like reading a book. Right? So a few years ago, we were in this place in the mountains of New Mexico where we go often. And I looked around and I realized, ah, there's not a tree, except maybe these oak trees right by the, the ranch house, that's over 100 years old. That 100 years ago, this was clear cut. There was nothing here. And though today it's a forest, it was not then, right? This is something that we often, like I've, I've noticed this here on Mallorca, that people have an idea of what the original landscape looks like. And then if you just scratch the surface a bit and look at the, into the history, here, for example, everybody thinks of Mallorca as the land of the almond blossom and almond trees around the, the, the landscape. And really it was in the 1930s when the, the vine rot came in that destroyed the, um, vine and uh, wine, grapes industry in both France and also came to Mallorca, that all the the vineyards were ripped up and the almonds came in. So it, it's not that old. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. And so how do we use what we see so that in our mind's eye, we can see this longer story, this process. And um, every story has a trajectory. And our lives are in one little piece of this millennial, you know, multi-million year story. And um, how can we play a role in that so it's moving it one direction or the other? And the, the thing that is striking to me is all these things, permaculture and the living systems thinking through Regenesis that comes down to the Sufis and Gurdjieff and Charlie Crone and tracking, they're all pattern ways of looking at the world. That you're, you're looking at the surface to see what's essential, what is out of time and space that's behind it. Because it's there that we can work that makes the mechanical world, the physical world different. Um, whereas if we don't change that, we can make the physical world different, but it will revert. Exactly, yeah. Because that's, that's, that's the fascinating thing about that idea of resilience, that so many people think resilience is always necessarily a good thing, but, but really it, the resilience of the degenerative patterns that we've created and the, what we were talking earlier, the, the, the way our minds have been coloni colonized with certain thought forms and organizing ideas, that's what bounces back. We, we, we try to keep doing things and we think, yes, we've achieved something. Look at this. That's an example. We can do it everywhere now. Mm -hmm. uh, copy, paste. <laughs> and, and then we're surprised it doesn't work because the, the system is built around resilient patterns that perpetuate it in its degenerative patterns if we right. don't go to the level of patterns. Um, right. But briefly, um, just for the sake of people learning more about it, because I, I, when I looked at your website and I kind of clicked through to the tracking project, I was struck by 100,000 people having gone through that program and mm -hmm. having worked with kind of vision fast and, mm -hmm. and solo time in nature and time outside um, myself. And, and while I haven't done any of the tracking work like the John Young um, A. Shields pattern myself yet also deeply resonating with that approach and seeing how transformative it is to people so 
learning about yet another watering hole and organization that has taken 100,000 people through such a program. Please share a bit more on this. They had some sure. like the Arts of Life program that I think you're also involved in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to say one thing before we get there. Yeah. Okay, so this, um, you were talking about the colonized mind, right? Yeah. So Paulo Freire is in pedagogy of the press coined that term. And he was looking at why is it that we have these remarkable revolts and then the previously oppressed people, when they get into power, they're as bad as the people that were in power before them. And I was in Zimbabwe a few years ago teaching permaculture and I got to see this firsthand. And when I was in college, Zimbabwe was a great hope for all of us, right? There's Bob Marley songs about it. And Bob went there and, um, and it's as you're saying, because if our minds still think that power is overpowering, when we get into power, that's what we will do, right? And so I think mostly what we're up against is, is how do we not decolonize our minds, but rehumanize our minds, re-indigenize um, our minds, that we are part of a living system and we begin to think and work in that way. And it's striking to me, right? Even resilience is a physical, mechanical term. Right? It's, it's not even a biological term, even like what's the biological mechanism for that? What would be, and so I'm always trying to notice how my mind is colonized by that mechanical point of view and how I might think about it and phrase it differently, how we would use, and it's difficult with the language, languages we've got. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, so the tracking project, um, my friend John Stokes, he was in Australia many years ago and followed a young woman there and he ended up teaching at an Aboriginal community college and all these old guys, began to teach him things. And um, he wasn't trying to learn any of this stuff. And they taught him to play didgeridoo and they taught him to track by like taking him to the park and watching kids get off the bus and say, oh, that one doesn't have a dad at home. How do you know that? Oh, watch, he can't kick the soccer ball. Nobody showed him how. And so he realized they were constantly tracking. They, and then he came back to this country, someone sent him, to meet Tom Brown. And um, he said, oh, that's a word I can use for all this stuff I'm learning that I would like the urban Aboriginal guys to learn and appreciate from their culture. So he went and found this guy, Jimmy James, Uncle Jimmy, um, who was in the same town and a famous tracker um, and hung out with Jimmy for a few years and then came back and taught at the tracking school in New Jersey and then came with a handful of guys out here and uh, to New Mexico. And when he had been going back and forth, um, they had used him as a runner. So at that time, they were seeing Aquasasne notes from Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois country, about land rights. So they said, go meet those guys for us and tell us, take them this message and tell us what they said. And so when he got back to the States, um, they asked him to help train their young people. And so he formed the tracking project to help fund that. Um, so, um, and that has since spread worldwide. And it's kind of, we joke all the time that the tracking project is like a few coolers and a bag of fire sticks and a bag of our knee sticks and a few tents and sleeping bags. That there's, it's not in the stuff. Right, and it's all on the remarkable people that have come through the project and contributed to it and acted as teachers and mentors. And, um, and so I've learned a lot from that way of looking at things and John's way of working. Um, and he too is a wonderful storyteller and has taught me a lot about how do we actually communicate and how do we actually work on shifting fields. So um, he tells the story of these people came to a tracking class to learn about. And said, John, here's what we got on our notebooks. And he sh they were blank. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't know what you did to create leadership and community, but you did it in everything you did. 
So that's that tracking piece. That's that pattern piece. It's not what you do. It's how you do it. Yeah. How do you teach fire making in a way that causes internal locus of control? How do you teach tracking so that it gets people to consider externally to be able to see systemically in a living biological world? Mm. How do you um, run things so that everybody feels like they have a leadership role, whether they're four or 40, right? So, and that's also behind all the work we're doing at Regenesis. It's not about what we're doing, it's how we're doing it, right? And how are we getting, and the biggest thing, the two things I'm realizing more and more, Daniel, that are so important. The first one is getting to that place where I don't know and asking for help, whatever that means internally, externally. Because otherwise I'm just doing the same old crap I've done before. It's things I've thought before. And the other one is um, to set the bar high for everyone and everything that everyone here is as capable as I am, that they are, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about me helping them be creative. It's not about me being the creative genius. Yeah. Which is, again, I mean, all of this is so deeply resonant with indigenous wisdom from um, First Nations people all over the, the globe. The, the, the little glimpses, I've nowhere near got the, the same depth of having been privileged enough to learn from people directly like you have for so many years, but, but like, for example, working with Gigi Coyle and people from the school of lost borders and doing a vision quest there and sitting in council, um, there have been moments where I've touched into that world or, or like talking with Dominique and, and with, with Jason about their um, experiences in Australia. Um, it's, it's so fundamental to keep an apprentice pilgrim mind, and not the hero mindset of, of our storytelling of it. Like even I think this, this, this hero's journey story that people get so into is, is still far too focused on this um, idea that it's one individual that is going to take people to safety and, and really, um, yeah. How do, how do we, enable everyone to bring forth a healthy whole in which everyone can keep evolving um, and learning yeah. um, and and that, and this dance with humility this this paradox that we're now faced with such urgency because of the mess that we made with so much of the biosphere and we have runaway climate change and and cascading ecosystems collapse and and again, like the back coming back to the question that you start your book with, which I also want to talk about, um, like this could like I, I often leaning towards what I've learned in rite of passage work and 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 working with council and the the wheel of the four directions. Maybe climate change is that point in which humanity at the species level is put through a rite of passage, which has this oh. pattern that I think lies at the heart of why you call Regenesis, Regenesis, that we actually need to face our, face our own death and mm. die to the patterns that no longer serve in order to stay current and serve the greater whole. So it's this Joanna Macy's beautiful um, uh, hospice workers and midwives. It's that mm. role of constantly embracing collapse and and patterns dissolving if they're not the right patterns any longer and constantly listening with humility of what wants to be born um that that um i think we need to come back to and like you earlier said the word re-indigenization which is for me something that 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 i more and more ask myself how do i do this where i am with my family as the way of sourcing and resourcing my work um mm. to, to to really live that that how how do i become indigenous to this island um that that i've chosen to to live on um but yeah tell me a little bit more about um as far as i understand as a synthesis of your personal framing you've 
come to call all these funds <coughs> drunk from and, and integrated in your work, you, you call it pattern mind. And, um, and, and now you're finally <laughs> putting it into a book. Um, I say finally because it will be a gift for all of us to, to, to be able to, to read that. Um, can, can you say a bit more about this, what you understand uniquely about pattern mind and, and, and also please talk about your forthcoming book a bit. Yeah, um, I would love to. And I want to say one thing about this idea of um, indigenous peoples re-indigenizing, that there is, um, it's easy for us all to romanticize native peoples. Right. And that um, it's one of the things that I learned living on the reservation for almost 10 years is there's, um, it's been bad. It's been horrific, right? And um, we're lucky that people have held on to what they've held on to. And that um, this is true of all of us, right? That the Indian schools, the Native American schools and the Aboriginal schools in Australia uh, the, that were purposely to deculture and to um, colonize people and their minds were just the latest iteration of this process that's gone on for a long time. Right? I took, it was only a few years ago I realized when I was a kid, taught, taught was taught about indentured servants. And these were people that came over to colonize America and they would get passage over for free and they only had to go work for people for seven years. Mm -hmm. Well, if your lifespan is 30 years, seven years is a chunk that and like peasants and serfs we were slaves our ancestors were slaves right all around the world this was the case and that was where colonization began right and um it's why then we went on and became colonizing armies because we were convinced that that, that right um and so this it's why I use the word um, re-indigenizing with that in mind, mm -hmm. that we have this shared history of colonization, of abuse, of, of all of those things, and we're on every side of it. And um, in the tracking project came upon um, Paul Freire and the colonized mind. And then also there's this whole story from the Haudenosaunee of the formation of the Confederacy, the Iroquois Confederacy, um, of the story of the great peacemaker. And a big piece of that, his message is about peace, the good mind, and power. That true power is from peace. And you must have a good mind to realize that. That if you are, your mind is distorted and troubled by trauma and things you've done, things that have happened to you and all of that, you cannot see the value of peace. Mm. And it's only when you, cause you want to, uh, I was right to be angry and act out. I was right that that's what we all do. And so there's a great depth to that story that can be read in a book called The White Roots of Peace. And a big chunk of it is a, a condolence, a, a healing, a straightening, a standing back up of ourselves. And within the um, ecological design realm, there's a wonderful book called Tending the Wild by M. Cat Anderson. It's about California and the use of fire and other disturbances by native people to regenerate those landscapes. And this idea that human beings, by getting their food, fiber, shelter, energy, all their needs met, increased species diversity, yeah. increased the biological strength and power of ecosystems, an entirely different story than the one we've been telling, the mechanical story of us not belonging, um, and that this is looking likely true all around the world. There's Just, um, just, just recently, um, I mean, we, we've all heard the, the stories of a few years back of, of showing that the Amazon largely uh, terra preta soils being basically planted yeah. forest gardens, but, but just a few weeks ago um, in I think the central plains um some discoveries were made where, where it, it's it's in clear that there were Kansas, yeah. american cities that 
were literally farming the prairies and that the, the numbers of bison roaming was, was increased through um, careful stewardship and and and, and even the the chestnut oak forests of the northeastern united north america um that was because of burning and planting there's um all this work the wonderful book black emu from australia of fire stick farming and how the waterways were worked with and um european examples and all around the world, human beings understood their places well enough to know where, when, and how to make tiny changes that helped to regenerate the system to another level. Just, just recently, I was talking to a, one of the people that I'm learning from here on, on Mallorca, um, a real craftsman, um, permaculturist, regenerative agriculturist, and, and stonemason called Miguel Ramiz. And he's writing a book about the history the past and the future of agriculture at the moment. And he, he, in his research, he's, he's just tunneling into really everything. He's, he's, he's sort of slightly on the spectrum in the way he works with stuff, but in a beautiful way. Um, and he, he told me the story that the Iberian Peninsula was the first place the Roman want-to-be empire started to invade. And it was the last place they built the entire empire until they actually colonized the Iberian oh. Peninsula. And you know why? It was a clash of two agricultural systems. It was an acorn people against the wheat people. And they were trying to bring in the wheat culture into an acorn culture. And, and when he told me that, I thought that that's the story of North America. And, and, and um, yeah, fascinating. Well, Mollison used to say it's, it's the battle of humanity between tree people people and grass people, whether it's grass grains or, or pastoralism. And you, you may know, right, Andalusia was an oak forest mm -hmm. and that the oaks were cut to smelt the silver that was mined in Spain that funded the late Roman Empire. Yeah. So those great vast plains and Don Quixote, it's what you're talking about, Mallorca, right? We yeah. think that what we know is what has been. So, um, in the systems thinking work, the, the living systems thinking work we have, are engaged with through Regenesis, um, there's this idea of disruption or disturbance of our typical thought patterns, right? Because we're such creatures of habit, like every other living being, that we will stay in that rut until something kicks us out, right? And what seems like a nice groove eventually becomes an inescapable rut. And so I began thinking about, ah, well, in martial arts, and it's even in permaculture, right? The least change for the greatest effect, right? And the problem is the solution, yeah? Um, oh, well, that's fire stick farming, right? And um, it's also what you're doing to people's consciousness. Um, and so I thought, cool, I got that. So, um, Permaculture, I decided, was not about designing things, but it was about observing the trajectory of ecosystem, um, ecological succession. What level are we at? What would be the little disturbance that least change for the greatest effect that would bump the system up to another level of ecological succession, right? Which is what we see native peoples doing all around the world. It's usually taking what we call a climax system that's senescent Mm -hmm. And some disturbance moves it back to subclimax. So everywhere we look, subclimax systems are more species diverse and more productive. The aspen are far more productive than the spruce fir. The chestnut oak, far more productive than the beech maple. But, you know, everywhere you look, that's the case. As well as there's cascading impacts from it. You, you burn a mosaic pattern of the forest and kills the thin barked trees and encourages the nut trees. But it also buffers the pH of the soil. It's also going to buffer the pH of the waters, as well as the pH in the estuaries, which is going to enable all those shellfish to bloom. So you have oysters sufficient in the Chesapeake Bay to filter all the water within 24, 48 hours. But then I began to realize, ah, oh, wait a second. It's not just about disruption like we keep talking about so commonly in this era, right? It's not just you disrupt something and something new will emerge. Something may emerge, but it may not be better, right? Or it may not be richer. So you have to do the tracking. You have to do the observation. You have to 
not know, be a part of the system, and observe in a dis a, a non attached way, right? So that's like if if uh, the disturbance is where the seed is on the the soil surface, there's all the root work that needs to go into deciding what that disturb what story I'm going to tell you, right? Because most of us heard a story, had an experience, read a book, had a teacher that totally altered the direction of our lives, right? And then there's the whole branching of the tree. We must practice it. We must continue with other people to be engaged in this process of rehumanizing ourselves, of developing ourselves, our minds, right? Our whole minds um, as nested within larger beings that we're part of, that are minds, right? We, it's Gregor Bateson's whole point is that an ecosystem and a species, all of us bear the marks of mind. Well, again, as we were edging, I mean, these both these topics of where does life begin and where does it end? You were like, like I was thinking these Gaian cycles, like the carbon atom that's now in my lung, now it's here. Was it alive then, and, and now it's dead? Um, in a similar way, I think we like at the if we really go upstream, it is reframing how we think about what is life. And, and understand this life as a planetary process that manifests through us, but that all the wisdom traditions speaking about eternal life speak about the Gaian cycles of life being eternal. When you sink in with them, then you're given eternal life because like, then you're thinking of yourself as an expression of 3.8 billion years of evolutionary journey. Yeah? But similarly, mind even beyond that, if we, I, I have this hunch, and I'm, I, it's a not knowing, yeah, that consciousness is primary, mm. that what we're seeing as physical world is the enmattering of consciousness and patterns of consciousness, which are patterns of relationships and interactions and information flow between momentary jewels in the jeweled net of Indra manifesting as you or me or tree or river um, mm -hmm. and it, you don't have to answer to this bit of a <laughs> tangent but but that's basically i i i believe that the, the, this is this dynamic phenomenological worldview where we really bring forth a world in conversation like maturana and varela like, like to say um we everything matters like our our conversation has causal agency across these scaling fractal patterns of place and 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 consciousness <laughs> <laughs> yeah so for me where that hits the ground is in the tracking right which is also the same ways people have navigated the landscape, every landscape, right? You're talking about levels of landscape. There's a consciousness landscape, there's a spiritual landscape, there's a physical landscape, there's an ecological landscape, there's a socio-economic landscape. And um, the power of patterns is that they apply across scale and media, right? So that spiral on my hand applies all the way up to galaxies, right? Um, waves, cycles, right? The way nature makes resources functionally infinite is by cycling them, right? There doesn't have to be infinite water. It just has to go up and come down and go up and, right? And trickle through the landscape and be held in the landscape. It doesn't need to be infinite money. It just needs to cycle around. Um, and that's also how life is eternal. It's cycles of life, right? Before your daughter was born, those cells that made her were alive, right? It goes all the way, all the way back. And um, so for me, it grounds always in place. Mm. And that includes me. Who am I? How do I work? What are the gifts I have to give? Um, and even beyond that, you know, David Bohm, he says, when we talk about subatomic particles, 
we're going to a mechanical mindset. Those particles are fields, they're waves, right? And so um, one of the things we're always working on is how do we shift the field? And as long as we're telling a story, which is we are bad and the only way to work is by shifting things mechanically and by God, we're going to stop this bad things and we're going, right? we're going to do the good things. You know, that's where you see very directly consciousness making the world, right? Because of the way I see the world, I do certain things that makes cups and laws and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, but if I go to, oh, the most effective place to work where causality works is in shifting the underlying patterns and fields mm. and that's something we need to do together i can't go off and do that for anybody right there's this th i was thinking about um i don't know if you've read the uh hero with a thousand masks yeah. by joseph campbell yeah. in the introduction he talks about regeneration and this is right at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, war is a trap. Peace is a trap. Failure is a trap. Success is a trap. That we turn anything into a rut. We increasingly solidify that structure instead of realizing that, no, just like the structure of my body, that structure serves at a certain point. But it must restructure and restructure and restructure and restructure. And those patterns are what continues throughout. So that if, um, and that's what pattern mind is all about, is how do we shift to seeing a living world of patterns and be alive in that world of patterns instead of in a world of physical structural things? And then how do we read that landscape to see ah, a little nudge here a little shift in this underlying pattern we don't have the time and energy and power to regenerate to rebuild restore the living systems of the planet what we do have the capability to do is shift the underlying patterns that would enable it to regenerate itself and it's one of these reasons we use the term this is because Regenerative design, I don't think really exists because I can regenerate myself. I can serve to re the regeneration of my community, but I can't regenerate you or your community. It has to come, regeneration must be from within. So what we're always working on is building that capacity and that capability. Um, and that's why if I'm the expert supplying the answer, it doesn't develop anybody's capability or capacity. It's working with people and places in a way so they develop the answer. They develop the path. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's so resonant with, I mean, that's why, like I, I purposefully put designing regenerative culture has, has a paradox in it. Um, because culture emerges and it isn't, is never designed, but mm -hmm. we all co-create it through our thought patterns what we communicate and how we communicate even just what we pay attention to and and how how we pay attention that's why like i've got 250 questions running through my book in order mm -hmm. to invite that practice of not at the end of a chapter saying oh i've just talked about bioregional development here are the 10 principles of bioregional development the minute you just reformulate those 10 principles into 10 questions that still speak to the patterns behind the principle you invite people's participation and you and you, you understand the, that that co-creating regenerative cultures is about living the questions together but tell me a little bit more about the book you're writing right now because you, you just okay. started the so it's it's bringing these three threads together mm -hmm. because there's they're all thresholds to seeing a pattern world the living systems thinking the permaculture ecological design and the tracking right which you could just as easily call navigation right? um how do we see the patterns of the world to guide us yeah um and using those and particularly stories to help people see um, things anew, right? So even that story of Mr. Quinchella about 
all, no square people here, right? It totally changed the way I was seeing the world. And maybe just for a minute, right? So then I have to practice in some way to continually re-see the world, to co continually question the things I'm most certain of. Um, and that's hard work and something we can't do alone. Right? And it's something that must be practiced. So um, this is all meant to be, there's this um, image amongst the Haudenosaunee of the white roots of peace. That's why the name of that book about that story is that, that someone were to encounter the little white root tips of the tree of peace, they could follow those roots back to the tree of peace and take shelter there and learn about peace. And so it's one of the ways I'm seeing this book is that there are many things included in it from all the teachers I've had throughout my life, even if I just encountered them in books or they were trees or mountains or whatever, so that people could follow those little roots back to those sources. And um, it's told as a large arc um, through little stories and lifting the patterns out and helping us re-see the way we see, the way we see ourselves and the way we see life um, so that we can engage at pattern level and actually work in the way that we must be working if we wanna regenerate the planet. Not just arrest death, which is, as you were saying, that's the wrong way of thinking about it, but what is the core pattern of how nature does work, right? You mentioned well, before we began to record this, Gregory Bateson's quote about most of our problems come from thinking differently than nature works. So how does nature work? How does life work? How would we actually look at ourselves and see how do we really work despite what our brain's habits tell us is how we work? And it is through this pattern of regeneration, which is about not creating a dichotomy, but seeing what is the potential in what appears to be a dichotomy. What is the value behind what we love and what we hate? And this very Buddhist approach of what is and what does that enable? What is the potential of the future? So that permaculture principle of the problem is the solution. That if we take that seriously, what would it mean that climate change is the solution? Petrochemicals is the solution. Globalism, colonialism, all of those things, that's where we should be looking for regeneration. That's the source of regeneration. It's in the shadow. It's in the muck. It's in the dirt. It's in the what we are trying to cut off, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is for me, this was a gift because I've been, I moved to Mallorca um, almost eight years ago now with this intention, like after having spent a lot of time at, at kind of eco villages and, and, and trend, working with transition towns, looking at the community scale of whole systems designed for sustainability and all that. Eh? Um, I realized that the real transformative patterns have to be um, looking at that, that nested wholeness up to the bioregional scale. Like, so yes, it's in place, but we have to, like I call it scale linking design and, and that somehow in the, the, the synergies you can build between communities and places within a watershed or within an island like Mallorca is where, where things can really, where even that conversation where you engage people at the regional scale to say, what is the potential of this place can really flourish. Mm. And, um, and so for the last eight years, I've been sort of acupuncture, exploring where, how can I start this conversation here? And I've, I've worked with a couple of documentary filmmakers that were making documentaries about sort of stories of hope. And, but recently, I've basically come to the conclusion that really has just been affirmed with what you said, that since the island is 85% dependent on tourism, the only way to engage a conversation powerful enough to shift the patterns of this system is to turn tourism, the problem, into the pathway for regeneration. And, and the key is we have no idea how to do that. Exactly, exactly. Right. That's, so that's how to start the conversation and who to involve in the conversation right. and see what happens. And the thing that I've been learning over the past few years, um, particularly through 
TRP, the Regenerative Practitioner, which is this education program that you went through through Regenesis. Um, is I've been stuck on that greater whole being something on the map, that it is a greater living whole. And that living whole might be agriculture in the Mediterranean. Mm, absolutely. It might be the economic system of, or it, it, one of the living holes we're working with now is natural history museums as a living system. Right. And um, it made me realize again how physical my mind is oriented, even when I'm thinking, I'm thinking in living systems terms. That, um, and I learned this from my students working on some projects with them in their coaching cohorts and their resourcing cohorts. Um, that I was going always to the watershed, watershed, watershed. And I had to realize, oh no, we might be working on architecture in a region we might be working on forest regeneration in a region and um, so i'm always learning how colonized my mind is by a physical mechanical newtonian reality of the world instead of this biological no no even the label of bioregion could could become a fault trap like that the, Absolutely. Let me ask you something, because this is something that I also grapple with, because I, I notice the, the wonderful attention to language that, that is part of the Regenesis way of working. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's always a shadow side to that. Like it can, sometimes can be a little bit more difficult, but that's an invitation to, to, for deeper learning, at least mm -hmm. for us that I didn't mind if people didn't understand me, but I didn't want to be misunderstood. <laughs> and, um, and, but, but even thinking of it as patterns, like if you use the framework of spiral dynamics and the kind of or the, 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 the or integral human development patterns where people are at different worldview systems and ways of, of looking at the world, then um, to what extent would you say that the minute you use patterns that are like language forms, um, words, concepts, that are still part of the mechanistic world, you're you can't but perpetuate them or is there a skillful means way of saying well in this context with these people the only way i can begin the conversation is using language that doesn't alienate them and and brings them into the conversation once they're rallying around it like even like playing with the fact that now people want to look at the problem of climate change. And they might even be able to stretch to say that the problem of climate change is a symptom of a larger process and that ecosystems collapse, cascading ecosystems, biodiversity loss, that these are also all symptoms. And the fragility of our current economic system is actually more upstream from that because it's the economic system that is part of the problem and that's an expression of the mindset and then you and then you begin to to engage how how do you work with that like sometimes do you sometimes kind of go here i go again using this mechanistic language and these mechanistic patterns in order to make people hear, hear me and then i take them on a deeper journey later or do you just never do that it's a great question. Um, and I'm not going to answer it directly. Um, I've spent a lot of my life being a bridge or a bit of a translator between cultures. Um, my mom was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. My dad was Jewish of Ashkenazi descent. And in the 50s, when they married, that was a big cultural difference. So I grew up in what may not now seem like a big difference, but I spent my childhood translating for myself, um, living between two worlds. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work I've done around the world is communicating to very different communities and cultures. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I've learned from Carol Sanford, which I think is great, you never meet people where they are, you lead them. You see where they are and you lead them. So that's one answer to what you're saying. And also, I notice when I'm doing what you're doing, 
is it's again a mechanical point of view. Here's the system, here's where people are, I wanna move them over here, I'm gonna use the words they can hear, and then I'll move them here, and then I'll move them there, and that, right? And it's um, the thing I always try to remind myself of is that what really matters is what's outside of time and space. And what keeps us trapped is that we are thinking we are trapped in time and space. And that is what is core to a linear, dichotomous, mechanical, physical worldview. Wow. Right? And I don't always know how to do that. And I've got to get to work on time. And the kids got to get there. And I get right. But it's what I have learned over the years, whether it's from sacred teachers or my experience in the wilderness or working with communities that the most effective place to work is in the field shifting the field that creates a different physical reality that enables us to have different thoughts to see different things to be in different relationships to one another and so i'm always looking at how am i reverting to a mechanical way of creating this living world instead of going no what is how would I be working on a field? Mm. Wow. That, I mean, this, thank you. Um, that, um, and I'm not always good at it. No, no, and I'm not always that, successful. But, but I, I know that that's, that's where we've got to, that's what it would mean to really have a patterned mind. Uh, wow. Is that that's where we are living, right? I just want to, because we're sort of at the end of the conversation um, for time reasons, but, but the, um, Two things I wanted to pick up on, um, and now I briefly have a momentary lapse of. Uh, <laughs> You're uh, out of time and space. Yeah, out of time and space. I mean, that that's deep for me, like to really uh, because I, I completely. That was what is another one of my hunches that that it's all about how we understand time and space, that mm -hmm. it's keeping us trapped. But but you, the way you just framed it. Um, made me see my own patterns uh, beautifully. So th thank, thank you for that. Um, what was it this? Oh, it's a shame that there was a beautiful link. But the one thing to, before, I, I really don't want to let you off the hook because I know that I'm, I would find it really hard to speak to that. But you also, as you're writing this book, you're asking people for some support so you can free the time to really work on it. Mm -hmm. Started a, a, a crowdfunding, um, request to help you work on it just briefly yes. tell people where where to find that and and what you're asking for y yes um well it's as much to um help fund all the help i'm needing in editors and all of those various ancillary aspects um as it is to get me enable me to set some time aside to get this done um so i've been working on this almost 10 years and it has morphed in many ways and changed in many ways and I've gotten clearer and clearer about what it needs to be. And um, I'm asking for help and um, my aim is for $20,000 and I'm well on my way. I've had some very generous donors, um, some individuals and some groups that have donated $2,000 and things like that. And um, I do not have the link up on my website. You're making me realize that I should put that up on the website, Daniel. So thank you for that. Um, it is on my Facebook page, which is Joel Blansberg. Um, and it is through the Institute for Regenerative Practice, the Regenesis Institute for Regenerative pra Practice. Um, and um, you have that link. And if you would put that with this video, I would much appreciate it. And now I also know what, what, what dropped earlier briefly. Um, mm, good. Way to close, and it actually relates to this project of the book. And uh, you earlier when you were speaking, of, I, I thought of this framing of making tacit knowledge explicit. And suddenly I realized that is part of the gift that the elders in Regenesis have really been working on and it's still unfolding is how because it's one thing to go on that journey of working of, of tracking patterns of reading the patterns of life of, of of translating between cultures of of working with process to shift 
process and learn that as a tacit knowledge that you somehow kind of feel what to say in the right moment or who needs to talk to each other or um, what needs to happen next. But it's a, another whole level to make that tacit experience that you've built up through all the stories, all the learning, all the elders that you've been gifted by, um, and to make that learning explicit and, and share it with others. And I, I think that's that's part of having only begun the journey of learning from from this amazing community that that Regenesis has kind of been birthed by. Um, I think that's that's one of the gifts um, that that you're all working on, sh sharing your experience over the last thirty, forty years of doing this work, but also as you have done this in this conversation, humbly. With, with a kind of, but what do we know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's it's why we've talked. We talk about this as a school, right? Yeah. Is that this all came down to us? We didn't invent any of this, really. It's just how do we apply it? How do we learn it? How do we develop ourselves? And that um, it's why we started the educational programs, the development programs, community programs, is because if it dies with us that's no good right it's like a martial arts or a, any kind of lineage is that the teacher's job the sensei's job which means the person just a little further down the path is to make sure that their students exceed beyond excel beyond their abilities right because if it's not going up each time it's going down right um and it's even what i've tried to do in the permaculture community is because it's going to all turn into rhetoric and dogma unless we continually regenerate it and question what we think we know, right? So um, it's why the program you attended, the Regenerate Practitioner, um, began was because we were never going to be able to grow Regenesis internally. We were going to have to help to develop a community around the world that would do their own work and we would mentor them in their development so that they could do this better and better and better. Right? Because it's not a one-shot deal. You take a week-long course or a month-long course and you got the information. Yeah. It really is beginning to understand how to develop your capabilities. But you so do that's it so what beautifully. Like I, just from me tracking the beginning effects of that, like um, the, of course the, the one community that really stands out is Auckland Bay and, and the work in New Zealand, but also in Australia and, and, and the Bay Area has, has, has a strong cohort now um, of, of multiple um, graduates from the TRP coming together and, and, and building. And, and also the, the European edges is, is growing after, like we, the first European TRP was here on Mallorca in 2017, but um, now there's one coming up um, starting today, not tomorrow, um, so sometime tomorrow. very soon. Um, yes. In um, which will end in Portugal, and, and they're even talking about doing another one because there's so many people asking for it. So I yes. think that it's there's there's a need for this wisdom, and so I, I really I'm so looking forward to your book, and I'm I'm excited that that you're writing it, um, and um, I'll certainly put that link in, and I'll also have somebody in mind who who enabled me to write my book um, with a generous donation, who I would like to. Um, Tell about you and, and, and this. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that, Daniel. I, I just want to say one word. Yeah. Everything you were just speaking to is because we've been building the field around regenerative development. So TRP is not just meant to educate people, it's to develop a field. And that's why we've begun to do them in nodes and places, because we learned from the, the New Zealand one that having everybody be in a place was much more powerful and enabled more work to happen afterwards and in between. And that's why we just launched this ongoing developmental series for people that's um, eight sessions a year for TRP grads. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, so we try to walk our talk and try to not just work on mechanically shifting things, but how do we develop a field and enable people like yourself to develop a field, right? It's why you sponsored that European 
cohort was because you saw it as a way of building the field that would enable all the work you're working on to be easier and more effective. Yeah. And I'm hoping that after this next European cohort, um, your life becomes increasingly easy and abundant. <laughs> well, same, same blessings to you and to hopefully everyone. That's, yeah. that's, that, that's what we're working for, that, that life becomes increasingly abundant for, it, for everyone. And mm -hmm. It's not always going to be easy because I think some, sometimes um, the, it's the pain that cracks the shell of, of our understanding. <laughs> it absolutely is. And I keep thinking this thing. Um, you know, we keep talking about how nature is cooperative and we should be cooperative. And it makes me realize that we may know that that's the key to saving the planet, but it doesn't tell me how, right? It doesn't tell me how to get along with people. It doesn't tell me how to use conflict in a developmental way. It doesn't, right? It, it just is like the ecological stuff. Be nice. Exhorting people to be nice. Um, is not going to get us where we need to go. Mm. It's about enabling us all to do the developmental work that's necessary, including truly loving our enemies, truly seeing them as our brothers, sisters. That's a great place to leave people with. Um, thank you so right. much for this conversation. And thank you, Daniel. Be well. This was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to more.